Most acknowledge that UFO reports are not restricted to one particular country or continent of peoples. It is a global phenomenon and those most closely affected by it, be they researchers or eyewitnesses, often come together at conferences staged throughout the world to share their views, information and knowledge. In December 1999, we journeyed to Acapulco in Mexico, a popular holiday resort on the Pacific coast, to participate in the last major conference of the old millennium. Countless holidaymakers flock to Acapulco from countries far and wide throughout the year, drawn by sun-drenched beaches, magnificent bays, and nightly festivities which are a throwback to ancient Mexican culture. But the main attraction of that December week was undoubtedly the Congreso Mondial OVNI, an event which saw several sparkling presentations by some of the best-known figures in international UFO research. During our week-long visit, we caught up with several of the speakers during breaks in proceedings to seek their views on matters which are both topical and of particular relevance to their own field of study. Among them was Dr. Bob Wood and his son Ryan, who, over the past couple of years, have made several outstanding breakthroughs in analyzing countless documents pertaining to an alleged covert UFO study group known as Majestic 12. Later, we hear from Dr. Richard Haynes, widely acknowledged to be the world's leading expert on UFO and pilot encounters. And we discover what persuaded best-selling author Whitley Stryber to turn his attention to a new book on the environment entitled The Coming Global Superstore. But we begin with Bob and Ryan Wood, who later this year will be among the guest speakers at the 19th Leeds International UFO Conference. The manual is an instruction manual for personnel to recover crash saucers and ship the parts to the right places. It does include special procedures for shipping from overseas. And so in that sense, it embraces the overseas aspect. Right. It's important to remember, it is a field manual for troops in the field. And I, I think that this was, um, it didn't give a broad, very broad overview of the program or maybe the other foreign intelligence that may have been available, but it was sort of a how-to manual. And when you look at the mundaneness of uh, a crate packing, it, it is uh, almost an identical copy of an existing field manual, army field manual from Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania where they have a re reservoir of all these manuals. And you can find the references in the back of the manual perfectly line up for the era and some of the documents changed shortly thereafter the manual was printed in April of 54. So it's, it's interesting that it's such a tight fit to that time frame. Uh, and even you might say that the fact that it's just about pick up you know, recovering wreckage and so forth and not about all the other aspects that you mentioned uh, lends towards its authenticity uh, rather than detracts. There are some other subtleties associated with the language too. For example, the use of the word screwdriver is two separate words is the way it's shown in the manual. And that is consistent with what was in the dictionary in like 1949. And then over the next decade, it changed to one word use as the uh, application to a vodka drink got more prevalent. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned some of those things. I mean, the first thing I think of is the control page uh, in the manual. At, at first, the control page was not distributed because Don Berliner didn't perceive it. And then later it was discovered, and the control page has specific changes in the manual, and then initials and authorizations. Um, and some of the initials, the um, JRT and EWL, uh, we've been doing research and trying to identify those specific soldiers that would have been responsible for that in uh, the Kirkland Air Force Base phone book. Uh, stamped inside the manual is uh, uh, unit uh, this unit KB-88, uh, Building 21, Kirtland Air Force Base. 
and we found there really is a building 21. It's now called building 750. Um, and we can't determine whether or not there was a unit 88, but we're in a, a, a correspondence with the historians of Kirtland Air Force Base, and we've been given verbal authorization to get the historic phone books to review and look for EWLs, JRTs, and then ultimately find those soldiers and ask them those questions. Well, we certainly welcome criticisms or concerns about the authenticity of the manual. In fact, we keep a running list of the best way to deal with those concerns. And well, one of the concerns, for example, was a, a raised Z. And what, what happened was when I first met with a specialist at the government printing office and asked him, I said, well, what do you think about this, this manual, this document? Does it look authentic to you or not? And he, he studied it and puzzled over it for a little bit. And, and he said, well, it looks to me like the type is right, monotype modern. And then he, he looked and he says, and it's interesting, he said that every so often the Z's are raised like we used to get in those days. I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, because once in a while in letters that were not frequently used, they would only have a few master, master brass letters in, in the stack. And, and then every so often you'd get some sort of a piece of lead on the bottom and you would find a repetition of the Z being raised in particular. So my partner and son yeah. went to the Stanford Library and he found a document that was authentic, 1954, with just a few raised Z's. And, and you actually see uh, lots of variability in the E's and the A's, not so much on their lining up, but the formation of each of those letters when studied under 400% magnification, you can see that there's it's a mechanical process. And the answer is that as Stan Friedman and I followed the trail of the Special Operations Manual, he, he continued to receive correspondence from Timothy Cooper, including copies. And I didn't know that. And then, you know, as we were talking along, he said, well, you know, I'm getting stuff from a guy who lives in California. In fact, he says he lives a lot closer to you than I do. He's a big Bear Lake. Why don't you go up and visit it? So I called him and, and went to visit this guy, Tim Cooper. And he said that over all the years that he'd tried to been get some interest from somebody in the UFO community, I was the first person to drive up the hill and say hello. So he was therefore motivated to exchange information and after a couple of meetings with him myself, then Ryan and I met with him together. We probably had six visits, uh, many dozens 20, of hours. Yeah, 20 or 25 hours time with him. So Timothy Cooper's background is that he grew up in uh, near Alam Alaman Air Force Base in Alam Gordo and his one of his close relatives was assigned there to um, work in, in the army, and, and he had an he had an unusual experience where he was asked apparently to uh, run copies of a classified report which had to do with the crash recovery of the UFO, and he told this story to Timothy, and that caused Timothy to get some interest. So that as of 19, 1988, Tim began to file freedom of information requests. And that ultimately transcended 12 different agencies. He has 5,000 pages of freedom of information request responses in his, in his living room. Well, there's he basically has six, five, six, six different source elements. The first element was um, the Legionnaire. He met at the local Big Bear Legionnaire who gave gave him the air accident report, which he later forwarded to uh, Leo Stringfield, who published it in his uh, book, Status Report Number 4, I believe. And then he had another source, um, a CIA archivist, who apparently contacted him and met him in person in a parking lot and handed over the Marilyn Monroe document, which mentions MJ-12 and the 5412 committee in the lower left-hand corner and signed by James Jesus Angleton. Now, was that an original document or was it a photocopy? Both are photocopies to present. Um, uh, and then the next source or rival was um, Cantwheel, uh, the alias Thomas uh, Sigh Cantwheel, as we've 
Tom, I think Cy is his middle name or first name, but uh, Thomas Cy Cantwheel. And you got mailbox drops first, and then there was an in-person meeting with Tim. Uh, and then Salina. There were three mailbox drops and then a meeting. Right. Then Salina, uh, the daughter of Cantwheel, a year later, sort of, I believe after Cantwheel passed away, um, sort of wrote a note and attached more documents and said, my father's dying wish to the effect is that you have these. And so they were delivered. Um, and then finally, in 1999, on July 9th, he received a package from a source called S1 in the mail, and also a package from the source S2, uh, which included a large manuscript that was on, originally unclassified that was stamped Top Secret Magic. So those are the six sources that right. Tim Cooper now, winds up being the conduit for. Now, it's important to emphasize that you know Tim tried to correspond with Dick Haynes and Tim Good and uh, Stan, Friedman. Stan Friedman and maybe a couple other serious researchers and wrote them letters, gave them documents and so forth, tried to get them interested at all and they weren't really responsive or interested. Um, and from 1992, I believe, to 1996 until we got involved, he just kept them in his attic. He was kind of like, I'm not sure they're real at all. He was quite skeptical. He, he was. He was very skeptical. And he wasn't out to make money or do this or the other thing. He just sort of sat on it. You know, he has a full-time job as a security guard. What is it about these latest documents which have got you to, I think it would be fair to say, excited? Yeah, it's the uh, the original paper and original ink and original typewriting. Uh, that's the number one thing. Because those are all forensically testable. Uh, and then the sheer volume of material. Uh, the sheer volume of original obscure material. Uh, when you talk about obscure material, what do you mean obscure material? Well, things that you couldn't even contemplate fabricating unless you had... Uh, a degree in military history, had 10 or 20 years as an archivist in one of the many presidential libraries or national archives. I mean, you need those skills to try to create or fake something. Uh, they're just but the most weird recent, the most uh, recent uh, or difficult to find. Yeah. The most recent documents that have arrived really uh, contain quite a range of material in the sense that some of it is stamped in red top secret magic or top secret MJ-12 and others of it are merely newspaper clippings that were included in the original blue book files. So now, now we're talking, forgive me, we're talking about blue book documents that are not contained in the National Archives. Yes. New blue book documents. New blue book documents. Um, Many of the documents are unequivocally blue book documents. One of the documents not only references Blue Book in, in sort of a notation on the upper right, but it also identifies MG, MJ-12 and paperclip files, all in the same same document. Uh, right. But it's, the document itself is a publicly available technical paper on nuclear propulsion. Right. Yeah, that's actually one of the ones that are posted on the website on, on www.majesticdocuments.com is we posted the first 10 or 15 pages of a report on uh, isotope thermal thrusters by John Martinez, who is alive and well today. Um, and this report is stamped top secret magic. It's a photocopy now, but the man's alive. Um, he has the right expertise and background. Um, everything sort of checks. The only thing that hasn't been done is to go confront him or ask him, "Is did you write this? Um, and that's a tricky situation because I believe for the first time we have somebody who's fingerable as a source for reverse engineering and reverse sciencing. Here's a technical paper with top secret magic on it. It's talking about propulsion technologies 
in the 50s, or actually, his papers are from the 50s in some cases, but this is actually a 1968 or 69 paper. So it may sound an obvious question, but how can we have a process guy? Uh, well, the first thing he would do, suppose he's still cleared, he would call a security office and say, Bob, 